for those who have seen me in the past, I presented the Emerging State Actor Model. This is an update. Uh, disclosures on the funding. This has been funded by Project Mead in 2017 for counter ISIS modeling, and recently we completed a small business innovation research grant, at the Marine Corps War Fighting and Analysis Center. And so we, but those are very small funding relative to the overall effort, and they didn't make decisions of what I'm presenting today. And oops, there we go. All right. So why develop generic social technical structure? Coming out of this, we want to describe a quote that I'm going to paraphrase from Forrester because it's on one of his seminars. System dynamics deals with problems that are of interest to people. And I think that's what he said, but it's pretty close as most of what we do in system dynamics is people as a common denominator. Many of our applications deal with social technical structures and often, especially in the early modeling effort, we don't model them. I've seen models that are describing the dynamics of infrastructure, but they have a very aggregated, simple population beneath them. What we are bringing today is some suggested generic, simple social technical structures that many of you have been familiar with, but showing how in combination they can give you a baseline for very interesting and sophisticated behavior. So the three things we're presenting is demographics and social identity. Who, where, and what are they doing? Sentiment, what are they thinking and how are they feeling? And affiliation, how does that thinking cause alignment to actors and organizations? So these three are not necessarily to be independent, but combined. For those who don't know, the emerging state actor model was originally designed as a conflict model for counter ISIS modeling. It has 15 sectors within it. I'm not going to get into the all today, but it has four playable actors, a local state and non-state actor and their foreign support in a foreign um, support to the state and non-state actor. These four actors are contesting over civilian segments, which can be modeled for any amount of ethnographic uh, identity, civilian segment uh, partition. So that what you're really doing is modeling a social technical structure under various forms of conflict from uprisings and mass protests all the way to conventional. The model does not model conventional. That's a different class of problems. We didn't model that, but it does cover things like clandestine terrorism, insurgencies, protests, uprisings. And key to that is obviously understanding what is the sentiment of the population and how are they acting and reacting, not as a block, but as in different groups with different interests. Uh, we did have the model reviewed in a systemic review that was published in uh, the Journal of Defense and Modeling. They looked at about 600 insurgency models, picked out about 15, and identified that one of the areas of opportunity in our model is we did not have social identity. When we first modeled the counter ISIS, there was like a block of the population, didn't really have any social identities within it, and they said that could be improved on. So we took this opportunity with the Marine Corps to add that work. Um, the research, the use cases, we, in addition to the original counter ISIS, we did a hypothetical use case of a Ukraine post-conflict stabilization. This is hypothetical, only for use of experimental, but it was designed to show the Marine Corps how these can be used for future forecasting to say, what if hypothetically there was a um, ceasefire on the line of control in uh, December of 2022 that split the country on the current line of control with the blue actor, or the green actor would be Ukraine, supported by NATO and EU. The red actor would be the LNR and DNR separatist areas and they'd be supported by Russia. For each of these scenarios, we then did a counterfactual fork in the future. And in one scenario, there's a departure of the Russian troops after three years, and another scenario returns to a frozen war. The second scenario we tested was the Myanmar civil war under a context of uh, doing a humanitarian intervention in 2029 after a tsunami. Tsunami and earthquake hits. The question is, what would the uh, forces face when they're doing a humanitarian mission and conditions nine years from now so they can understand what they need to prepare. And in that, the two sides are the pro junta um, Barma majority and the anti junta those are two, and then the other ones are the coalition of ethnic minorities. So we took these as different use cases in different regions, different areas, different contexts to say, can we bring real data into this model to instantiate these conflicts? The demographics and social identity is not a new structure. The gentleman from Cambridge in the back of the room here in the middle of the room, you'll see some of these in these books. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're showing how these work together. What we did is we created a simple aging cohort, ages 0 to 80 in five-year cohorts. We did male and female genders. We actually tried multiple more genders. We can go up to five at least. Uh, we also did social roles. So we took a distribution and we took, for each country, we took um, an age cohort and a gender as a slice. Then we combined that slice and assigned it to a social identity. There were seven social identities we used, uh, students, sort of K through 12 students, college students, workers, activists, retired, unemployed, you know, sort of seven care workers. 
those seven social identity roles we then map, and I'll show in the data later how we did this, to reporting to say, who are these people and what are they doing? And as they move through time, this upper area then sort of calculates from the overall population. Remember, we're not tracking individual people. We're not tracking Tim as he goes from a student to a college to a worker. We're tracking distributions of population as they move throughout this uh, time period. Our models are usually 10 years, so there is change in this time period. The data comes from the World Value Survey and NASA. The NASA geo uh, spatial data may be familiar to most, but the World Value Survey has 30 years of surveys every four years, so it is a credible historical record. It's not aligned with any government. The data is not behind the paywall, and what they do is they go out and survey on the sentiment, opinions, and sort of perceptions of the population. They have a large amount of credible data. They have solid methodology. And what they do is they have questions that you can then align these roles that we pick from. It lists in there by uh, ethnographic segmentation, what percentage of say women of this age are of activists or workers or retired. And you can use those to create a table that then gets uploaded to create this. Now it's a bit of an eye chart, but just to clear it, the civilian segments, we have multiple civilian segments. So this is for each civilian segment. It breaks out men in column A, Across the top is the age court by, uh, cohort by five years, and then you're seeing a percentage allocation of the civilian segments in that country. Now, again, for Ukraine, this might be split by Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians, Russian-speaking Ukrainians, Russian-speaking Russians. In Myanmar, it might be uh, pro-Junta Barma, anti-Junta Barma. In the U.S., it might be uh, Southwestern Blacks, uh, Northeastern Whites. You can do these segmentations. It doesn't always have to be on race. It can be on religion. It can be on sentiment. You can do these and then map this data, and what you get is a distribution of the population. So when you take the NASA data in and say there are so many people in a given area, you can distribute them across these social roles. When you have that data, you begin to do lots of interesting things. So we start on the left with the three civilian segments. We then segment them in two genders and 20 age cohorts. We combine those slices going left to right into seven types of social roles. The social roles then tell us across facilities, civil infrastructure and civil services, what are they using? Students need schools, workers need businesses, caregivers need medical services, and these are all based on the usage rates we got from other data sources, often SDG, so that you could understand what's being used by what person, how much percentage of the time, and this itself is a distribution based on a week to say, um, so much the percent of time of a college student is spent at school, or it's spent at a job, or it's spent, you know, at home, but a retired person may spend more time at home or an entertainment facility. From that, you can then do schedules of where they are. And in these models, we schedule during student uh, school days, during the week, regular weekends, school holidays, and then sort of natural cultural holidays. So any point, this 10-year model, you not only stand who they are, you can say what they're doing where, and that gives you assessment of impact if there's a uh, violent event or a natural disaster. And we also were able to model emergency schedules where their schedules were altered because of ongoing violence. The sentiment is another uh, structure from the gentleman from Cambridge. It deals with fast expectation and slow anchor. It's a very simple sentiment formation, but it's very powerful to understand how people are thinking and reacting to what's going on in your model. Now, we use this for conflict. We used it for the perception of legitimacy of the state and non-state actor, but you could use it for acceptance of government policy. Um, and you because you can divide it into these civilian segments, it doesn't have to be a monolithic fabric. You can really target the sentiment by that segment, even down to that social uh, identity. It's a fast expectation. What are we currently experiencing? Modified by a slow anchor. Very simple structure. Um, here is depicted the structure from our model. The short term, the fast expectation, the short term civilian sentiment, it's formed in months. And it deals with the delivery of services. Am I getting services from the government? What's the sentiment change from information operations? So now you can plug in an approximation. We're not here to model Twitter, but you can uh, plug in an approximation of information, disinformation, misinformation. You can put that in. And general levels of violence. Again, our models deal with violence. So the slow anchor is something measured in years. And here it's direct violence against the population. Uh, from this, you can calculate the legitimacy and the best choice for now, and you can begin to calculate relative momentum sentiment between actors. Now this is, shows the affiliation, it's the last key structure. This is a simple material chain, and in 
state actor, you full legitimacy govern. They may move to calculated legitimacy, which is best choice for now. They may move to coerced, and they may move to unaligned. And if they're unaligned, they're going to look at that relative momentum and then choose to enter back with another actor. But you can make this material chain anything related to your model. From this material chain, you can determine how much support the population is giving a in this case, a fully governed individual may be willing to pay more taxes and willing to fight and willing to support, where someone is coerced may be more resistive and require more uh, influence to control. But whatever your model is, you can adjust those. Some examples of how this is used, this is the ISIS model. It simply gives you the depiction of a human terrain where those policies on the left show how far ISIS would progress. And you began to see that they're struggling when they get to an area where the ethnographic terrain underneath them shifts from majority Sunni to more composition of Kurdish Sunni and Arab Shia. This is the post-conflict stabilization case in Ukraine, and it introduced a paradox that even in a ceasefire, there's a dramatic drop in the perceived legitimacy of the state actor because the infrastructure services are destroyed, and now people are saying, the fighting's over, refix the infrastructure, where are my services? And it creates that drop, but then recovers slowly over time. Again, these are hypothetical, they're not meant as forecasts, but to show the capability with the Marine Corps. In Myanmar, what would be met in 2029? This allows you to do the counterfactual for Here is the legitimacy perception under both a reconciliation, that's the blue line, and if the civil war continued. But because you've done that segmentation, you can actually break it into the different ethnographic groups and begin to understand the permutations and dynamics where the pro-junta and anti-junta Barma, they reconcile, but the ethnic minorities get persecuted more because now the majority isn't falling against them. You can see here that played out in the short-term sentiment from general levels of violence. And you can even see the net instability change. That big spike, by the way, is where we insert the natural disaster of a tsunami earthquake. That's the demolition and destruction by natural means and then the ensuing instability that arise from the lack of infrastructure until it was recovered. And then the long-term sentiment from directly experienced violence. This is the key one that the, um, the ethnic minorities, a lot of people would think, well, if you reconcile the civil war, that causes less violence. Unfortunately, in many conflict scenarios, you have a situation where if the majority splits and they reconcile, they once again target the minority ethnic group. So this shows that it might actually be worse off for the uh, ethnic minorities that the pro and anti junta Barma reconcile. Again, you can use these, we're using these in a scenario of conflict, but it shows you the, the detail you can get if you're doing transit or opioid policy or uh, any sort of policy that involves people, if you can track who they are, where they are, what they're doing, their sentiment, you can begin to add these as um, barriers perhaps to implementation of policy or help in targeting. And the benefits of the generic social structure, this all leverages existing theory. It's mentioned in the paper where we get them from. Social identity pulls from sociology. We have a sociologist on our team. We didn't invent new theory in this. It leverages existing structure. These existing structures exist use them, but combine them to create novel effects. And it leverages common validated data sources. As I, I only mentioned too, the NASA and the World Value Survey. The benefit of this though, is it took us, when I did the original ISIS model, it took me months to instantiate that model. The Myanmar model took weeks, the Ukraine model hours. So we've gone from, and this is without any APIs or technology, but by using data sources and adjusting the model, we're able to instantiate a country under a given situation much faster than we were before. Uh, the useful insights, it's not any one structure. Don't put in a dem demographic structure just to have it. What is your problem you're trying to solve? What are the insights you're going to get? And how does that structure apply to it? And then confidence, the unit consistency, conservation of mass, and first order control. These can be very tricky from unit consistency and conservation of mass. You can't combine all your sub-segments of people and have more people in the country than you start with. So you have to pay very close attention. By using common structures, it makes that problem a lot easier. It's useful across many cases. We've mentioned this here in the conflict sense. We've also used these with volunteer committees, communities, and other aspects. It isn't the structures themselves. You can pull them out of the, the conflict scenario and use them in other scenarios. So I'll end now with some time on it and see what the questions are. Sure. So you mentioned that this improves your um, time to build a model. Yes. 
Can you talk about the time requirement to collect this type of data? So that was the challenge from the Marine Corps. They said, to be the premise, there is no magic database in the sky behind a classified material and identify every source of data you would need to populate this model and how you would bring it in. Now, they didn't require us to automate it. So actually, in the actual report we turn at the end, we have like 30 different mob data sets. Some of them are NASA, some of them are UNSDG, um, some of them are World Surveys Value, but we avoided like, we didn't want to go with the one-off academic paper that reported good data once, but maybe never does it again. So these are consistently repeatable, regular deliveries of data that you can use to ingest. They're also not paywalled, so you don't have to, I mean, I'll, there is a big risk that these days, a lot of data is moving behind paywalls. So that's a consideration as well. But the using the existing data of high quality data lets you sort of reduce the risk, never eliminate it, but reduce the risk that you're using your own data in these models. I have a question for all of that. It's like, so when you test on multiple data sets, is the unit of the data consistent with the model itself or not changed? So this way, the question was, when you use multiple data sets, is the unit of the model consistent with the data you get? This is the big question. I did this lecture at Cornell and I spent 15 minutes on unit dimensionality. You have to plan in advance for conservation of mass and unit dimensionality and have a really clear, almost architecture of how you want to do your units. And the way we did is you think at the top, it's the entire population, the civilian segment, it splits into who is controlled by which actor, then it splits into these identities, and then it splits into the different buckets. But all of those buckets together have to equal. And when you bring the data in, if you compare it to that architecture, you know, we're using people. So people is pretty consistent in this reporting, but you have to sometimes do normalization if they say 97% of the houses have electricity. You have to figure out the per capita household, the average household size and then what that means in people so you can plug it in. And we did some of that manipulation, it's documented in our report, but you do have to normalize sometimes. <laughs> um, what about the compatibility? You mentioned that different countries have different identity groups. So does it mean you have to view like, different structures for each? This was one reason we ended up going with the World Value Survey. They actually use consistent social identities between, but where the differences arise is in different cultures and even different civilian segments within a country, what percentage goes to college, for example, right? If you're a male 20 years old, you may have a much higher chance of going to college than if you're a woman 20 years old, or if you're from a suppressed group. So that pulls out those differences in the distribution. But World Value Survey also does do local customization of political affiliation. So they won't, they'll have what are the political parties and you'll be able to identify the support for those political parties. So the social identities are consistent across the 80 countries, but there is local knowledge you can use that we're using in the model for like political affiliation or in Ukraine, perception of foreign actors, NATO, EU, in Myanmar is perception of Southeast Asian actors, some of the coalitions down there. So they do, it's a really good data source. Thank you. So kind of these uh, different affiliations with different uh, political uh, right. groups, uh, that is a dynamic um, thing, it's kind of just dynamic. How do you, I'm just wondering, how do you formulate the shifting across these different uh, political groups? It's, uh, sure, we use, the, we use the sentiment anchor. If you think of the short term as Calculated legitimacy, I, I'm okay with you for now. And the long-term anchor is the, the legitimacy, which is the full opt-in. This theory here, and uh, let me go here. This left-to-right theory, we didn't create this. It has legitimacy, calculated legitimacy, coerced. That's an existing structure. We use that sentiment anchor to regulate the flow back and forth in the material chain. So if you take the percentage of the population controlled by the actor that is fully legitimate in the sentiment, that should be about what it is in the stock. And when a discrepancy, we have a simple discrepancy adjustment over a time delay that will shift it. And as you begin doing things that lose the sentiment, you will see people go, and this is some of it in our other papers, you'll see the population go from right to left and from left to right. And in cases, they can go all the way to the left, come unaligned, and either come back up to a different actor as calculated legitimacy, or they can start an uprising and start joining the non-state actor group. So it's a the material chain is the, the governor is the sentiment adjustment. Right, that's all I have time for Tim. Thanks, Tim. Yeah.